Um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Katrin Rampe. She's the Arabic program director at the University of Minnesota, where she teaches various levels of Arabic, as well as courses on Arabic literature and culture, and trains graduate instructors in the teaching of Arabic as a foreign language. She holds a PhD in Arabic with a focus on literature and linguistics from Georgetown University. Her publications have um, appeared in the Journal of Arabic Literature, Modern Language Journal, and several edited volumes dedicated to foreign language pedagogy. Her workshop and conference presentations have centered on language program direction and curriculum design, instructional strategies for the foreign language classroom, and modern Arabic poetry. Additionally, she regularly speaks as a guest lecturer on the cultural heritage of the Arabian Peninsula and is a certified actual OPI tester for Arabic. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you everybody for being here. It's nice to see friendly faces. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Yas Alizadeh who made such a beautiful case this morning uh, in her talk for the importance of social justice pedagogy. Yay, I'm going to be talking more about that. She set me up well for it. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen. Yeah. Can you all see the slides okay? All right. There we go then. As educators, many of us share an interest with students in the pressing social justice issues of our time, issues related to identity, diversity, various forms of oppression, and also on the positive side, of course, social action. These are matters that are globally relevant, including in the US and in the Arab world, of course, and that are part of our students' lives in various ways. At present, while Arabic is a foreign language textbooks, especially for the intermediate and the advanced levels, might include textual material that touches upon such issues, no Arabic textbook series exists, to my knowledge, that is firmly embedded in the principles of social justice pedagogy. Yet this form of pedagogy, which emphasizes, among other things, critical thinking and reflection, and advocates for the incorporation of students' backgrounds and experiences into the curriculum, constitutes a powerful educational framework. I quote here Heather Hackman, who describes what social justice education does, quote, it encourages students to take an active role in their own education, and it supports teachers in creating empowering, democratic, and critical educational environments, end of quote. Further, its focus lies with dialogue and an analysis of power and is student-centered. Morianne Adams and Jimena Zuniga add that, quote, social justice education focuses attention on the ways in which social group differences interact with systems of domination and subordination to privilege or disadvantage different social group members relative to each other, end of quote. As such, social justice pedagogy is concerned with inclusiveness and the visibility of those who may be lacking it. It is concerned with teaching meaningful content and with supporting students as they explore making contributions positive contributions to their societies. It has the potential not just of adding relevance to students' language studies and of fostering their growth toward engaged active citizens, but also of deepening our own pedagogical practice as reflective and critical educators. In this paper, I will discuss what makes a social justice curriculum, hoping to demonstrate how well it suits language classes. I will give examples of what such a curriculum could look like, both when designed from scratch and when based on a textbook. To ensure I, will, I stay within my allotted time frame, I will not show the video material I mentioned during this talk, but I will have it available to watch in the breakout rooms during the Q&A if anybody would be interested. So when do we consider an Arabic curriculum to be grounded in social justice pedagogy? Hackman out outlines a model of social justice education that consists of five key components. Tools for content mastery, this is what you're teaching about. Critical thinking, reflection, awareness of multicultural group dynamics, and tools for social action or change. 
If we have not systematically incorporated one or more of these components, then we cannot consider our curriculum to be truly grounded in social justice pedagogy. For example, many of us teach about topics that relate to important social justice themes, such as exclusion, lack of access to resources, but also activism and so on. But if we are not also letting the backgrounds of our students in our classroom inform our teaching, or we are not also supporting our students' exploration of avenues for social action, or incorporating systematic opportunities for reflection and critical thinking, then we are not really teaching for social justice. So what then would an Arabic curriculum guided by the principles of social justice pedagogy look like? And what follows, I'm first going to give an example of the advanced level curriculum I designed at the University of Minnesota. Next, acknowledging that many of us have to work with prescribed curricula that are based on a textbook, I will touch upon some ways in which we might adapt such textbook-based curricula to become more grounded in social justice pedagogy. All right. So at the University of Minnesota, our target proficiency levels for the two semester advanced level sequence are advanced low to advanced mid on the actual proficiency scale. The courses are conducted exclusively in Arabic with the exception perhaps of a single project. Not using a textbook for this level has given me an opportunity to create a curriculum from scratch. The curriculum units are thematic and include, for example, refugee access to education, art and community in times of crisis, public health and health care, minorities in the Arab world, and human rights. It is possible, of course, to teach some of these unit themes with a focus on social justice, but also without. For example, a unit on arts or healthcare in the Arab world could remain entirely unrelated to social justice. However, when our approach to the materials revolves around questions of access to art and healthcare, or beliefs about the role of art in grappling with social political issues, and art's role in sustaining communities facing exclusion, then our subject matter becomes more social justice focused. As we know, staying on target with our curriculum design is easier if we follow the principles of backward design, which involves after selecting the unit theme, the development of essential questions, and in our case, not just unit goals, but social justice takeaways. Additionally, we can measure what learning objectives we're hitting by aligning our unit materials and our assessments, not just to the world readiness standards, but to the social justice standards developed by the Learning for Justice Initiative. This was previously called teaching tolerance. You might know them under that name. Some concrete examples. As open-ended and perhaps somewhat provocative guiding questions for the unit, essential questions could look something like this. The example is from the unit focused on healthcare. Is healthcare coverage a basic right that all should be able to enjoy? What are some of the causes of public health crises and issues in the Arab world? What barriers to access to healthcare exist among Arab communities? Why do healthcare systems differ from one country to another? And should vaccination be a matter of choice? Social justice takeaways for this unit, that is understandings related to social justice that students can carry with them beyond the end of the class, could include the following for this specific unit. Access to healthcare services is affected by a number of factors, including citizenship status, ideology of policymakers, national economy, and active policies of exclusion or discrimination. Individuals and communities may have different grounds for mistrusting or resisting vaccination. Healthcare is extended to communities and individuals in the US and in the Arab world in unequal ways, leading to systemic inequality and the worsening of public health crises. How do I align my unit, not just with the content oriented world, world readiness standards, but also with the social justice standards that I mentioned? The learning for justice standards are organized into four domains. They have to do with identity, diversity, justice, and action. Studying why people have different degrees of access to healthcare aligns with the following social justice standards. This is in, within the justice domain. Students will recognize unfairness on the individual level and injustice at the institutional or systemic level, that is discrimination. Also, students will recognize that power and privilege influence relationships on institutional levels. 
Whereas learning about, for example, the different reasons that people or communities could have to mistrust vaccination aligns with the social justice standards in the diversity domain of having students respectfully express curiosity about the lived experiences of others and exchange ideas and beliefs in an open-minded way. Note that these social justice standards do not seek to replace the um, world readiness standards, but can perfectly well be paired with them. They are a way of checking for ourselves as curriculum designers, if our materials and our activities actually get at our social justice related goals. Here are some examples of the content that is included in this unit on healthcare. So after activating the vocab, particularly with an eye on enabling students to communicate about healthcare needs and globally widespread illnesses, we read a text about the high incidence of diabetes in the Arabian Gulf states. And we discuss the factors that contribute to this problem. Next, students research some of the major public health challenges in a number of Arab states. And I like to choose those that never get a lot of visibility in the Al-Kitab textbook series, which they use in previous years. So in this case, Algeria, Yemen, Iraq, and Sudan. The students present their research to the class. This is followed by Q&A with their peers. Next, students watch an Al Jazeera program that addresses how many people are covered by health insurance in various Arab states. And that also discusses the access to health insurance that different uh, groups of people in a single country have. Finally, students watch two videos related to vaccination. One by the World Health Organization that was part of a public awareness campaign in Arabic and the other from BBC Arabic. And the latter video addresses, addresses issues with a British flu vaccine that um, contains a pork derivative. And so it discusses the hesitance of some British Muslims toward that vaccine. And it um, presents a variety of different opinions by British Muslims on the topic in the form of their tweets. I very much like videos that present people's tweets because they're a very uh, pleasant way of uh, displaying different opinions. These two videos then become the subject of a critical class discussion around questions such as why the video from the World Health Organization mentions children in poorer areas who don't get vaccinated, but doesn't mention, for example, the existence of an anti-vaxxer movement in the US. Another discussion question is whether getting vaccinated should be a matter of choice or mandatory. I created this unit before the COVID-19 pandemic started, by the way, but it has gained some extra relevance these days. Okay, oh, uh, what's happening here? Okay, summative assessments for a unit like this can include a structured class debate in Arabic around the somewhat controversial thesis statement, getting health insurance should be a personal choice, not an obligation or a government responsibility, and then a reflection. As an interpersonal and presentational assessment, students could interview in Arabic a class guest who has expertise in the field of healthcare and then compose a reflective essay or a flipgrid video um, on their takeaways from the interview. Social justice focused assessments could also, however, take the form of semester long project based learning. And I think it is here that we have the most powerful opportunity to give shape to that social justice pedagogy component of having students explore opportunities for social action. The key here is to enable students to offer, based on what they've learned in their Arabic class, something meaningful, something connected to social justice that they can offer to communities beyond the classroom. This is the example on the slide arising from my unit on art and community in times of crisis. I had students work together as a class on the organization of a public facing event on Zoom for which they invited two Arab artists, they selected them themselves um, and engaged with the artists about their work. The event required students to use their knowledge of Arab artists and to work closely together to agree on the guests, the event structure corresponding with the artists flyer design, advertising, composing interview questions, and so on. The students themselves asked if they could attach a fundraiser to the project, and so we did. And the result after um, two months of preparation was that the advanced class had a fascinating one and a half hour public conversation with Palestinian painter Sliman Mansour and singer uh, Ruba Shamshoum. Uh, the conversation involved 50 audience members on Zoom who also asked questions. 
and that more than 750 people ended up viewing the event on Facebook. And the students simultaneously raised almost $1,000 for Netakellem, which you might know as an organization that employs people who've experienced displacement as language partners. So this example shows that offering students tools for social action does not mean that you have to go walk in a protest march with them. There are different ways of many different ways of meaningful positive social action that students could take based on what, they, um, what they've learned in their Arabic class. In the case of this project, the students created an opportunity for hundreds of people to hear in detail about the artists' work and their lived experiences. And they were able to support these artists a little bit during the pandemic, a time during which a lot of gig opportunities had uh, dissipated for artists, and they were able to raise money for a good cause. Okay, mm, that slide just jumped. Okay. Now, what then if you do not have the chance to design a new curriculum from scratch, but you want to incorporate social justice into your textbook based curriculum? Here are a few simple ideas, and they start from the El Kitab textbook series. And I realize, of course, that, um, thank you, Jeanette, that not all of us uh, use El Kitab, but many of us at least know what's in it. As an observation, not a criticism, El Kitab's first and second year curricula are not grounded in social justice pedagogy. The third edition gives a nod to a diversity approach without being focused on social justice. While the story-based structure of some of the units in the El Kitab part one book may make a complete overhaul of some of these units towards social justice a little bit more challenging, you can of course incorporate supplemental material that goes some way to, for example, visualize those who have not found a place in the book. Who has not found a place in the book? Among others, that would include to a large extent, people who hold blue collar jobs, and also people with disabilities. And this of course obscures not only the lived experience of millions of people in the Middle East and in the US, but also the lived realities of some of our own students and their loved ones. So here I will give an example of an activity that seeks to address this and that seeks to give added meaning to the El Kitab chapter that involves, uh, that includes vocab about hobbies and sports. This is in the third edition, chapter six of the part one book, and then in the second edition, chapter seven. The supplemental material starts with listening and conversation practice based on a video excerpt about this gentleman, Mohammed Hamiz Khalaf, who is an Emirati weightlifter, who's also a wheelchair user and has competed in the Paralympics. At home, students complete the pre-listening questions, the comprehension questions about the video, and then basic discussion questions. Classwork around the clip starts with students gathering the information they have learned about Mohammed Hamiz Khalaf, doing various spoken comprehension quest, uh, exercises on the clip. And then we are set up for a broader scaffolded discussion in very basic Arabic on the following topics. Are students familiar with the Paralympics and Paralympic athletes, as well as with the Olympic Games and why not, or why? <laughs> In their opinion, are people who are very good at sports champions or heroes? We use the word batal in Arabic, right? Why, why not? Why do the students consider, who, sorry, do the students consider champions or heroes or exemplary people? And that question comes from content in the video. Muhammad's coach in the video speaks about him as an exemplary person. Students' homework assignment then asked them to research one of the following people. These are just examples, of course, um, but I think they're really good ones, maybe. <laughs> Samer Muadad, who is a photographer who focused on the Lebanese civil war in Al Gaza. Mohamed Kreka, a teenage painter who paints people from his Gazan community. Hawa Taktaka, a singer who fought the British occupation of her country, Sudan. Orim El Ifranji, who designed an animated cartoon for children with, that revolves around characters with disabilities. So these are all people doing things relevant to social justice, and students can speak about them in basic terms using the vocab that the book offers, a taswir, a rasam, a film cartoon, etc. So you have now elevated the chapter to be not just about pleasant sports and pastimes, but to include a focus on people from the Arab world who either lack visibility in the textbook 
or who each in their own way contribute to positive social change. In other words, if you are tied to a textbook, you can review it chapter by chapter and look for what Glenn, Wesley, and Wassell call entry points for the social justice approach in as many places as possible. Such entry points could lead you to adjust your vocab list, uh, for example, to include a short one about blue collar professions to make them more relevant to uh, students' lives. They could lead you to include video clips of people from very different places in the Arab world, not always Egypt or the Levant, but also Libya or Mauritania, for example. They could lead you to reoriented chapters about food, healthy lifestyles, etc., toward questions of access, acknowledging that many people live on tight budgets and that economic pressures place constraints on people's daily schedules. And they could lead you finally to incorporate images and photos maybe more mindfully to avoid stock photos of white people or rich people or clip art cartoons um, and instead use images of real people from all corners of the Arab world and images that mirror the diversity of the students in your classroom. These are things that maybe sound self-evident, but mainstream textbooks, not just El Kitab, often focus disproportionately on experiences of people from the middle class, on the physically abled, etc., at the expense of giving visibility to the lives of others. So here, these small interventions may be able to make a big difference. So that is it for my presentation. I've tried to show that the social justice pedagogy framework can very well be uh, incorporated into world language classes and inspire our classes from the beginning through the advanced levels. I've touched upon some specific examples of ways to go about this, and I would really love to hear questions and comments in the breakout rooms. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kachin. Um, our second speaker will be, I don't want to pronounce your name incorrectly, is it May Zeki? May. May Zeki. May Zeki. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. May Zeki is a, an associate professor um, at the American University of Wuhu. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce this either, Sharia. I don't know. Sharia. That's all right. I, I apologize. <laughs> I don't come from Arabic background. Uh, in the United Arab Emirates, she has a PhD in linguistics from Middlesex University in the UK. Prior to moving to uh, the United Arab Emirates, she was a lecturer at Middlesex University, where she taught classes in linguistics, translation, and Arabic as a foreign language. Uh, and not only there, but also at Egypt, the UK, and the UAE at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. Her research interests includes corpus linguistics, translation studies, Arabic as a foreign language, and digital humanities. She has professional experience in curriculum development, program accreditation, teacher training, lexicography, and translation review. So welcome, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, you can see my screen, right? Yes, and before you start, um, is it possible if you could put it in full screen mode? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, one second. Yeah, is that okay? Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, great. All right, so before I start, I just want to say that it is um, 11, 12 p.m. now in, in the UAE. So if I start blabbering on and on, apologies for that in advance, I'll try and be as focused as possible. Okay, so um, today I just wanted to share with you some thoughts about Arabic teacher training for the post-COVID era and hopefully present some ideas on how to make that, um, to make that based on a complete model for uh, teacher training in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. So, okay, one second. Uh, all right. Yeah, it's working. Okay, so this is the outline of the presentation very briefly. I'm just going to share some questions and challenges that um, um, uh, we, we've all been asking ourselves in the last year, all of us involved in education. Um, then I'm going to talk specifically about the theoretical background for this presentation, the work on teachers' cognition and the TPAC model. Um, I'm also going to talk about situating that in the Arabic teacher context. 
And then I'm going to present some thoughts about um, the TK component or the technological knowledge component to make that model complete. All right, so um, welcome to the post-COVID classroom. This is the uh, picture that we never imagined in our wildest dreams, but we've all experienced it last year, uh, all through the world, the Arab world and uh, the rest of it. And um, Arabic teachers found themselves living in that picture, which was something that uh, proved to be very challenging indeed. Um, why has it been challenging? There have been a lot of talk and a lot of discussion throughout the last year about the challenges that the post-COVID world uh, presented to us in the classroom and in our schools. Um, the general challenges revolved around the ideas that teaching plans and materials for teachers around the world were severely disrupted. Um, teachers' knowledge and skills of ICT literacy were uh, challenged considerably to various degrees, obviously, depending on where you are. Um, and finally, teachers' perceptions of communication and relationship with their students, which everyone took for granted until COVID happened, all of this was forced to be revised. Um, so as a result of all those challenges, we started asking ourselves a lot of questions, but maybe some of the important questions are things like um, how to organize efficient activities via online teaching when everyone shifted to the online mode so suddenly. How would students respond to online delivery? That was the worry of a lot of teachers. And uh, also the fundamental question for a teacher is how to redesign our teaching materials to suit this online mode. Um, questions are, uh, like these were asked around the world, but questions for um, Arabic teachers specifically were even more than that. Arabic teachers in the Arab world, and I'm talking generally about Arabic teachers for Arabs, Arabic teachers for non-Arabs, Arabic teachers in public schools, in private schools, the whole uh, scenario, um, they were also being challenged in different ways. Arabic teachers in the Arab world have been for the last maybe 20 years being bombarded with a lot of terms and new techniques and strategies and methodologies and approaches about teaching Arabic in their professional development courses or in their teacher training courses. Um, things like um, distance teaching, electronic teaching, virtual teaching, hybrid teaching, and blended teaching suddenly became all um, very hot topics last year. In addition to all the techniques that they have been hearing about, uh, things like the flipped classroom and the task-based teaching and game-based teaching and so on. And not only that, but they had to think about this whole thing in relation to how they're going to deliver it via synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, classes. So I really feel bad for Arabic teachers because they had to maybe deal with a lot more than other teachers. Um, looking at these, some of these extra challenges for Arabic teachers in the Arab world, we are faced by some observations that I'm, I mean, you can agree or disagree with some of them, but generally this is the case in the Arab world. Arabic teachers are largely at the bottom of the food chain in the school. <laughs> and that is, um, that is not a very good place to be in terms of professional development and the rest of it. Uh, but that is true. If, if uh, math teachers and science teachers had to deal with a lot last year, Arabic teachers had to deal with more. Uh, add to that the top-down approach that is generally followed in the Arab world in, in, in the education sector in, in the schools, whether it's private or public, it's usually a top-down approach. All the rules and regulations come from the top and teachers largely have no say. Uh, traditional Arabic teacher training backgrounds where teaching is uh, almost always teacher-centered, you know, traditionally, is also another challenge. Um, but then, we'll come to this um, component of technology, which is really the focus of the presentation. Now, the, the word technology is not new. It hasn't been new in the Arab world. We've been hearing about using technology in Arabic teaching 
for the past 15, 20 years or even more. But sadly, in this part of the world, the word technology has been associated largely by this culture of ticking boxes. So did I transform my teaching material from paper to some PowerPoint slides? Yes, I used technology, tick the box, and that's it. So that does not make things easier as well. Um, now, again, technology and the Arabic language itself as a language, they had um, a lot of uh, some sort of a love hate relationship throughout the years. And actually, the, the fact that until now in 2021, if you are a Mac user, especially you want to copy and paste some Arabic text into an Excel sheet, you will still have problems representing the Arabic letters correctly on your screen. That is a difficult situation. Um, but that's the technical side, as well as the human side of this, is that a lot of Arabic teachers in the Arab world, when they shifted online, they had to use tools and platforms and software that is all designed in English. And even the menu of that platform would all be in English. For many teachers, maybe that's not a problem, but for Arabic teachers, it could be. So um, this leads us to the final challenge about the infrastructure itself for technology. And you know, speaking about social justice earlier, we all are aware that in different parts of the Arab world, technology infrastructure problems are still a reality. So where do we go from there? Let's look at the theoretical um, framework that we want to approach in order to find solutions to these challenges or try to make Arabic teacher training um, a better experience to deal with those challenges. Um, the whole research in teachers' cognition is not new. It has been going on since the 70s. Um, and there's a lot of research on that from different angles. What they were looking at is that um, the changes that happened in teachers' cognition and definitely the change that happened last year um, about education and language teaching affects a lot of levels. It's a multi-dimensional um, entity. So any change that happens, it has a ripple effect on the different layers there. Uh, I've just mentioned here a few examples of uh, research that has been done on teachers cognition. What they all have in common is that they agree that the, this concept of teacher cognition is a very complex concept. You can study it from different angles, as I said. So some of this research focused on the conceptual understanding of teacher cognition. Some of it focused on the factors that affect the development of teacher's cognition. And some of it uh, looked at the relationship between teacher cognition and actual classroom practices. Now, what is included really in, in teacher's cognition? A lot of things, everything that is directly or indirectly related to the process of teaching. So um, the researchers tell us that teacher cognition may involve teachers' beliefs, knowledge, theories, attitudes, assumptions, metaphors, and conceptions about, here on the left, we have things that are directly related to the teaching process, including teachers and students themselves, the subject matter, curricula, the materials, and the instructional activities they're involved in. But on the right here, it also included under teachers' cognition are general factors that have to do with personal issues for the teachers, their previous learning experiences, their previous teacher training experiences, as well as much broader issues of language policy, whether on, on an institutional level or on country level. Um, how do we represent this teacher cognition model? Um, the work of Borg in 2015 summarized the elements and processes in language teacher cognition. In that form, he focused on those three main elements, schooling, professional coursework, and contextual factors. Um, but what do we uh, take away from this work on teacher cognition? The benefit of technology for language teaching and learning cannot be underestimated when we talk about teacher cognition. It, it forms a fundamental part of it. However, we also have to emphasize that teaching with technology can be complicated and can be a difficult task for some teachers under the influence of social and contextual factors. And this is even true in the Arab world than anywhere else. 
Building on that work on teachers' cognition, Schulman in 1986 designed this very interesting model about uh, um, that he called the PAC, PCK, that stands for Pedagogical Content Knowledge. So he was trying to describe what actually constitutes teachers' knowledge. And he differentiated between pedagogical knowledge and content knowledge. So um, content knowledge is knowledge of the subject matter, pedagogical knowledge about pedagogical strategies and approaches. Well, what is even more interesting is that in, in 2005, Kohler and, and Mishra built on uh, Shulman's work and they designed an even more interesting model, which they call the TPAC, where they try to describe the relationships and inter interactions between teachers' knowledge of technology, of pedagogy, and of subject matter or content. So they differentiated between three types of knowledge here. And this is how we could visualize this model. So we have the content knowledge here, which is knowledge of subject matter to be taught, the pedagogical knowledge, knowledge of how content is learned and taught, and we have the technological knowledge, which is knowledge of how technology should be used to deliver the content. And what is very important about this model and the visualization of it is that those three circles are intersecting circles, which means that we have this uh, uh, core intersection point here, which refers to technological, pedagogical content knowledge, the TPAC, which is central to this whole model. And it represents the integration of those three different types of knowledge into the teaching and learning process. So from that work of uh, Kohler that he went on to develop in, in various publications, we, um, uh, we uh, re come to the conclusion that effective technology integration for teaching content requires knowledge, not just of the subject matter or of the technology or of the pedagogy individually, but also of their relationship to each other. And we also re reached the conclusion that teacher training programs in general, that Kohler himself actually also observed, they do not provide teachers with the kinds of experiences necessary to prepare them to use technology effectively in their classrooms in a way that corresponds with that model. So how do we contextualize all this for Arabic speaker, for Arabic teachers in the Arab world? The assumptions from the TPAC model that we can start with is that first of all, knowledge of technology cannot be treated as context-free. We have to look at it in the context that it is used. Uh, the second assumption is that good teaching requires an understanding of how technology relates to the pedagogy and content, not just of how to use technology independently. And the third assumption is that teaching with technology, which we can extend to, to talk about the virtual mode of teaching, um, is a complex and multidimensional process. And this is how we might look at it. Um, it the TPAC knowledge includes all of these different layers of all of these different ingredients from understanding the representation of concepts using technology to knowledge of the pedagogical techniques that uh, utilize this technology in constructive ways to knowledge of what makes concepts difficult or easy to learn and how technology can help address those issues and finally knowledge of students prior knowledge generally and an understanding of how to use technology to build on the students existing knowledge so if we want to look at the te arabic teachers knowledge in that respect we find that there are big gaps in arabic teacher knowledge specifically and we can represent it in that way so we, we no more have intersecting circles we just have individual parts that represent these knowledge. Oh, okay. So we have the content knowledge, which is usually very strong or the strongest for Arabic speaker uh, teachers. We have the pedagogical knowledge, but there is no intersection between the two. And then we most probably have a missing technological knowledge. Uh, this could be related to some of the areas of, uh, that has been the traditional focus of Arabic teacher training, mainly focused on teaching Arabic grammar and vocabulary and rhetoric or lesson planning and learning outcomes and assessments, teaching the four language skills, teaching strategies and approaches. Some of them include cultural issues in teaching Arabic, especially if it's training for Arabic for non-native speakers. And then finally, some of the training, uh, teacher training for Arabic teachers include using technology in teaching. And I emphasize the word using because they just mainly focus on the tools really. 
but how do we build a proper technological knowledge component for Arabic teachers in the teacher training programs? I singled out four main uh, ideas that need to be um, the basis of this component. Defining the concept of effective integration of technology in teaching. Linking technology not only to tools, but to content and pedagogy. Understanding the transformative power of technology in teaching through, for example, going through models of how to integrate technology effectively in presenting your content. And finally, emphasizing the positive impact of technology and as well as its limitations. This can be achieved through these four main components of the, of the technological knowledge, understanding virtual teaching, the essential competencies in virtual teaching, designing an Arabic virtual class, classroom, and tools for Arabic virtual teaching. So the tools come really at the end. I'm just going to go very quickly over those four um, uh, components. Understanding virtual teaching uh, has to do, uh, it would have to start with understanding the differences between face-to-face -face teaching and virtual, te uh, virtual teaching, including different aspects uh, such as depending on various media for presenting content, the um, importance of collaborative work, the variety of sources for content, and the center of the teaching or learning process. We have to remind Arabic teachers that online teaching and learning is not inherently better or worse than face-to-face -face variety, it's just different. We need to focus on the opportunities that online teaching presents rather than the obstacles it puts in front of us. And finally, that learning outcomes are usually the same in both realms, face-to-face -face or online, but the teacher just needs to take a different route to get there. The essential competencies in virtual teaching, they are many, but they include things like the ability to change the cognitive perceptions of the teacher to suit the virtual mode, to have a leading and creative mindset and problem-solving attitude, time management and organizational skills, managing outside the class activities such as communication with the students and giving feedback, presenting content versus managing content and the difference between the two, managing teachers' presence and flexibility. This idea of presence has been very important, especially in the online mode, and it's not being discussed uh, nearly enough in Arabic teacher training, because if we look at this diagram very quickly, we can see that there are three different types of presence. All teachers know and do this all the time, which is the physical presence in the classroom, but the cognitive presence and the social presence are severely underlooked. That uh, designing an Arabic virtual classroom can go through uh, all, uh, uh, has to be affected by all of these factors from learning outcomes to the students, to the teacher style, to the actual tools that the teacher is going to use. Okay. Um, but in order to also include some of the models to help teachers um, conceptualize and facilitate uh, how to integrate technology in their teaching, the SAMR model is one of the very effective models in that regard because it lays out these four tiers of online learning presented roughly in order of their sophistication and transformative power from merely using technology for substitution to augmentation, to modification, and then finally to redefinition. Bloom's digital taxonomy has also been discussed a lot in the last year. Uh, teachers are usually familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, but the digital taxonomy adds to their knowledge in, in terms of using technology uh, in all of these six levels from the lower or uh, uh, lo lower order thinking skills to the higher ones. And we've even designed an Arabic friendly taxonomy pyramid <laughs> along the Bloom's pyramid using all the tools that you could actually use uh, in those levels. My final thoughts on this, and thank you for your patience, that there is a dire need to revisit the whole idea of Arabic teachers' cognition and what does it consist of. There is also a need to take a holistic approach to Arabic teachers' knowledge in the three components. We need to develop a complete model for Arabic teachers' training that takes into consideration those three types and their intersection points. And finally, technology and virtual teaching are a reality. We all know that by now, but it is time for the Arab world to really invest in it. Thank you very much for listening.